So welcome back. What I said before, uh, the systematic review process involves framing the question as the first step. Well, this is the first step in any scientific project. Uh, and then the various other steps, we will follow through them as we go through this webinar series. And for framing the question out of the five steps, uh, here is an article amongst many others published on this uh, topic that outline the various systematic review steps. Uh, here, putting all this in perspective with respect to the clinical process, the etiologic research requirements are met by evaluating uh, disease pathophysiology as highlighted here. Then diagnostic research addresses the space between patient presentation and confirmation of diagnosis. And then prognostic and therapy research is about what is the likely outcome and how can we improve the outcome. And all of this can be done by directly evaluating patients, which is primary research, or by evaluating the results reported and putting them together in a paper, which is a systematic review. And uh, the framing of the question, will this patient survive uh, with respect to a new treatment? The question need to be framed um, according to a structure, and the structure includes participants, exposure to a new treatment or intervention, comparison with the standard treatment, and the outcome in both groups. And these, these aspects are embedded within a study design. So in the case of this patient, whether he will survive or not, he was given two options. Uh, based on the standard treatment that they would normally offer in any, in any hospital in the country where this patient comes from, or a new alternative which is being tested in research. And then obviously, I am using this as an example of how to frame the question how this patient would need to be consented, that the design would need to be robust in order for the consent to be meaningful and that all of this need to be approved by ethics committees and other approvals awarded before you can put this question to the patient for consent. So with this background, uh, we look at this example of question, can coronavirus cause this disorder and the participants were people at risk, uh, those with coronavirus and those without uh, were the comparison. There should be a confirmatory test to be sure had or not had coronavirus and then their outcome can be confirmed by blood test or histopathology of a tissue sample or not the disorder was present or absent. Uh, all these would need to be placed in the context of a study design. And I requested you to look at your questions um, according to the structure. And just before we went on the break, a question was put to us by a colleague that they wanted to study people exposed to head and neck radiation due to a cancer in that area. And they wanted to compare a new type of fluoride uh, treatment for the teeth with the standard treatment. And their idea was to measure whether the progression to caries or other measures of dental health uh, were better as a result of the new intervention or the new uh, fluoride preparation compared to the standard preparation. If 
I may request any other colleagues who have prepared their questions to come forward and uh, let us know what they think. And here is uh, Mitya has offered me a question on chat. The question is, can we create an objective reproducible assessment of the anesthetic result of breast reconstruction and other breast surgery that can be easily implemented in practice. Mitya, are you also able to unmute your microphone? Maybe say a few more words about your question that I just read from the chat. Yes, I can. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you. Well, uh, actually, my question is uh, if, we, if we can really create a system that can assess uh, these results in breast surgery, because nowadays you have like a lot of uh, ways to assess the result of uh, breast cancer surgery, but not for the reconstruction. So uh, there are systems, but they're all uh, difficult to use. So my idea is to do something that will be automated, uh, if possible, using, using artificial in intelligence. Uh, Mitya, was I correct in making that assumption? Are colleagues also able to see the chat? Because I'm going to put my question over there. Result of reconstruction. Is it aesthetic aspects? Okay, I take this question forward. The participants in this type of study will be those who have undergone breast reconstruction the outcome will be some form of a measurement designed to capture the result of breast reconstruction. And in this case, uh, we don't necessarily have uh, the same elements as in the previous question with respect to exposure and comparison. Uh, and it's important to recognize that in not all research question would need to have these four or five components. In some, there may be other components and in some, there may be less components. So this proposed structure is not a straight jacket or compulsory or 100% necessary or obligatory. It is just that, a suggestion. And uh, you need to draw from it as many components as suit, as are suitable for your particular situation. And then to construct your proposal and the study design according to the various components of the question. Aesthetic objective mean, how does it look? Uh, Esther, you, you were asking, is aesthetic objective? Do you mean, uh, Esther, do you mind unmuting your mom phone to explain your question? Hi, uh, I don't mind. I will, it's a provocative question. Meaning... Of course it is. Can we measure aesthetic objectively? What is what is an aesthetic result? Does it okay. mean symmetry? Okay. Is it anything else? Is it the subjective thing maybe? Okay. So the first comment I would make is that this question about uh, the result of or aesthetic expectation or aesthetic aspects of the surgery, falls in the general category of research called instrument or measurement development. 
uh, in this type of research, the idea is to discover whether what we are trying to measure is reliable, reproducible, it matches with other measurements that may exist on the same topic, uh, and should the condition change, is the measurement responsive to change? So you can see that there is a whole subject about, um, there is a whole subject about uh, measurement. Now, Mitya, you are just coming back to say that you have a completely different question. Are you able to explain this by phone while I'm addressing the question of objectivity raised by Esther? So Esther, when we are in the field of measurement tool or measurement instrument development, this can be a very wide range of things. You know, It could be simply asking the patient, how much pain do you have from zero to 10? And you can see that pain measurement is subjective, right, Esther? Yes, of course. It and you can, can see that done. by putting it on a zero to 10 scale, you can add some element of quantification. But yeah, yes, of course, of course. So but I guess my answer to your example. question is using this example of pain and a scale from zero to 10 allows you to imagine how one could capture something that is quite subjective for measurement for the purpose of research. No. Yes, but Mitya's question was was regarding artificial intelligence, if I heard correctly. Uh, so, so can I, I am still unable to understand it. So might Mitya I be would, able to explain I will try to, to explain it better. Yeah, please do. Uh, the problem is that right now there are some ways to try to assess the result, but they are not used because they are too complicated. You have to do a lot of measurements and everything and nobody does it in, in practice. So uh, the idea is that uh, you could try to train an algorithm to do that assessment in a reproducible way. Uh, okay, you can what, take- What uh, elements take, are used in the current system to measure? Uh, usu usually you measure the breast. You assess this, the, you physically assess it and you measure like the, the various distances, and you use that as uh, as the structure for uh, for the assessment. But the idea is that if you can do it with uh, an automatic program with your phone, uh, it it could be much much easier because okay. you, you really could just uh -huh. get a picture and let the, the the computer do the work for you. Okay, so Mitchell, you are talking about training an app on a phone to give you a result. Exactly. And what the app will do in the background is simply a question of measurement. Yeah, it is. Uh, and comparison okay. between the two sides. to you and to many other people, you may get lost in what is artificial intelligence? What is an algorithm? Uh, how does the mathematics behind the algorithm work? What is image recognition? All of that is nothing other than a question of measurement. And a measurement requires for, there, for it to be usable, an important feature, that it can be applied in a simple way. So which is your point that you want something that is not cumbersome will be easily understood by any scientist who examines uh, your interest in artificial intelligence to help solve this problem. But the bottom line is your, so if we just go back to improving the description of your question, you have participants who have the need to undergo breast surgery. Then you have a tool or test 
to be developed and that test will in your based on your description use some features of computer science that automate the analysis of measurements and from this analysis of measurements you want to produce a result which says the outcome is satisfactory or not satisfactory how does that sound yeah that's the point all right so thank you so look by simplifying the question i'm not trying to take away the computer algorithm complexity that you're probably simply try to highlight is support to frame Uh, 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 and I hope you, you are back to where we were. Uh, we were talking about uh, the question of use of measurement or a tool for measurement. Marina had a suggestion or comment about the use of techniques for um, scoliosis. And you say that you can use a 3D scanner. It's not wide enough present at the ah, That's Mitch just saying that a 3D scanner can be used. Uh, and Marina, I was asking you, do you also use artificial intelligence or other such techniques uh, with images to, to evaluate the scoliosis? You might, you might you want to make some comments? Uh, not, we, we don't use it yet. We don't have uh, such a, um, we don't have artificial intelligence okay. yet, uh, but we, we, I understand problem that Mitya explained because we have a similar problem in the scoliosis tree. Okay, so look, the challenge is you, we, you understand the problem. I understand it better now after your explanation and after Mitya's explanation. I mean, the challenge is to present this problem in a structured way, so it can become a scientific hypothesis. So for example, if you have a new tool, an app, you can assess the test retest reliability of the app. You can assess the accuracy of the app compared to patient's expectation. Uh, if there is a gold standard available, you can measure the sensitivity and specificity of the performance of the app. So you can see that framing the question in a structured way is necessary to generate a scientific hypothesis. And also important in writing up what you're going to explain to your readers and your examiners. 
At this stage, I'd like to move to another question. Any other colleague would like to come forward with their question? Okay, so those of you who've been kind enough to come forward with their question and those who made comments, stay with me because the next thing I would like to ask you is what is the study design for your question? And ahead of doing that, I'll show you some slides that I have prepared on the topic. So the first most important issue that frequently arises is, is my study going to be a case control study? So I'd like to give here you some description of why it's important to make the distinction correctly. In a typical study, you will have a sample of patients who will be allocated to receive a new intervention or new treatment or control. If this allocation is by randomization, this will be called a randomized control trial. These people will then be followed up to see whether or not they have an outcome. And from the results obtained, an effect size will be calculated or a result will be calculated. This type of a study, what type of study is this? Can somebody comment? Is this a case control study or is this a cohort study? So we have, uh, Mitya is responding. He's saying it is randomized case control prospective study. Well, Mitya, thank you. I'd like other suggestions. You may want to explain by unmuting your microphone, if you wish. Well, you have a prospective study because you start with uh, from zero. You, you said that you will uh, randomize the, the exposure or not of uh, the population. And you have like a follow up of both cases. So that's my definition. Maybe I'm wrong, obviously. Other, other colleagues might want to comment. Marina, you, you may want to say something. I agree with Mitya. So, sorry? I agree. I agree with Mitya. Okay, I put this question to the whole group. Is this really a case control study? And why, do, why did Mitya use this term, case control? Mitya, you may want to explain why you use the term case control. Well, you have uh, the patients that are, let's say that the cases, the ones that are exposed to the experimental part and those that are not, and those are usually called so, like cases and controls. So control group and uh, cases group. Marina? Okay, uh, anybody else? Uh, 
um, well, maybe I would say that this is not a, a case control since you took a sample and randomized subjects into different groups. They received either uh, the experimental exposure or the, or the control one, and you're checking if there's a difference. But uh, the way I know it, the case control would be that we would take a group and see who has the outcome uh, or some outcome and who has not, and then check backwards what was happening before or if they were exposed to something. Yeah, who's speaking? Uh, Martina here. Well, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your name correctly. But explain this one more time to Mitya, because what you said is absolutely correct. Mm, well, so, maybe... oh, let, me, let me try to explain what you said, and okay, then you yeah. can correct me <laughs> if I'm wrong. So, Mitya, what you were explaining as case control is actually a cohort study. You were right that it is randomized, and randomized control trial or randomized studies are a type of cohort study. But neither randomized trial nor a cohort study can be a case control study. This is important to understand. Now, here you can see, as Mitya, you pointed out, that the time zero is the starting point and we move forward in time through exposures and outcome and the use of the word control confuses us to think that perhaps we are doing a case control study in a case control study the starting point is the outcome it's not the exposure or the allocation the case control study then goes back in time to check whether there is exposure. And then it uses all this data to calculate the effect size. This is a case control study. Did I explain it correctly? Okay, Martina, you said yes. Thank you. Uh, Mitya and Marina, please make some comments about what I just said. Marina or Martina? Anyone. Anyone. Go ahead, Martina, <laughs> if you want. Or no. Marina. I agree with you. It's maybe the other way around. In, in randomized um, uh, control trial, we would like look at something uh, when the time passes. And in case control, it's the other way around. You look at the outcome, define if it's present or not, and check back for exposure. So kind of the other way around. OK, now, look, I know many people in this session have not said anything about case control or cohort. But you must have been thinking that there is confusion. Now, I can reassure you that there is confusion. Approximately 35% of studies reported in the literature, which are called case control studies, are mislabeled. They are wrongly described as case control studies. And this is not only true of uh, the literature published in this uh, field of internal medicine, neurology, orthopedics, all across the subjects that is terrible. So please don't feel that you made a mistake. Uh, if you made a mistake, you are part of a group of journal editors, peer reviewers, and authors who make this mistake every day. Now, I hope by attending this course, this webinar, you will not make this mistake in the future. And when you submit your paper for publication, 
it will be correctly labeled. So this leads sorry. me to ask, sorry, go ahead. Yes, please. Excuse me, this is Robert. I'm just sorry for interruption, but is, is it right that cohort study is a prospective study? Okay, so now you're asking me the question, what is the definition of the word prospective? The yes, right, is that correct? And this is just for my understanding, as I understood what you were telling, I'm not sure if I'm correct, of course, the okay. cohort study is prospective study and case control study is retrospective study. Okay. Or is it Look, completely? Let me just take you back to the slide where I described this idea. I was very careful not to use the word prospective. The word prospective came from the description that Mitya provided. Okay. I described the term going forward in time for cohort study. And I used the term going back in time to look for exposure in the case control study. You can quiz any number of experts about what is the definition of prospective and I can confirm to you that they will come up with different definitions. I can give you my definition of prospective. It may not match with what you have read in the textbooks, but I urge you to use the word prospective very carefully with a specific meaning. And please explain it when you write things up. Don't imagine that people understand the word prospective. So I, my definition of prospective is the protocol was written before the study was conducted. How does that sound? That sounds that also case control study is of course um, in many times prospective. A case control study in my, according to my definition can be a prospective study. You write the protocol first, then you collect the outcome, then you go back in time and collect information about the exposure. And according to my definition, it will be a prospective study. It's not necessary that your textbook or your professors or your journal editor would agree with my definition. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, so I don't want to say that other people are wrong. I also don't want to say that textbooks are wrong. I simply want to say that there is a lot of confusion. So when you use a term, please just explain it clearly to me. About what study that potentially does not need to be a prospective study. You never, if you never write a poll, you simply go into a routinely collected database and look for hundreds of associations. At least some of them will turn to by chance. And then you report this as a cohort study of routinely collected data. Will this really be a prospective study? In my definition, no. For me, the key issue concerning prospective is that the protocol is written before the collected or before the data or before the collected data are examined. Can I have just one question? Uh, we have to, uh, so we have to specify which are controls and which are cases, uh, whether are the cases the, um, uh, those who are treated with the new drug? Whether uh, are the cases those who have the outcome? Okay. There's a distinction. Okay. Look, according to the textbooks and according to most experts who really know the subject, <clears throat> the term case control 
refers only to outcome. The term case control does not refer to exposure. That, is, is that clear? Did I make that clear? So how do we refer to those who were treated and those who were not treated? Uh, let's mm -hmm. say treated okay. or untreated because uh, a lot of times we heard uh, cases and controls. What would be okay. so the, when, the, when the you expression refer to for the, those? Uh, so when you refer to the term case dash control together, as written down in the right-hand side of my slide, this will always refer to outcomes. It will never refer to exposure. But when you only hear the term control treatment or standard treatment or routine care or placebo or sham, procedure, these refer to exposure. We normally do not use the term case when we refer to exposure. So now you can see that we have three terms. One term is called case control. Another term is called control exposure. And Another term is called cases, which are the cases of the case control study related to the outcome. Okay, we are just coming to the end of this session about discussion concerning terminology and design. Uh, we are going to have a 10, 15 minute break. Uh, we will come back then for the last session of today's webinar. When I return, we will continue to discuss the issue of study design. I would like that colleagues who described their uh, questions earlier, uh, this time talk about their question with respect to their study design. And I would also appreciate if other colleagues would also come forward with their question. Uh, because what we are talking about are fundamental issues about which we as trainee scientists should not be confused. So I'll see you shortly. And I look forward to more discussion about the correct terminology for the various study designs.